in science, uh, students are encouraged to doubt everything, question everything. Nothing is true because the teacher said so, or the textbook said so, or the website said so, etc. That applies to any conclusion, and it applies to theories like evolution. And so if someone were to doubt or to question evolution, well, in a scientific sense, that's appropriate. That's your job. However, in science, then, there is then the more important step which follows. It's not just about doubting, questioning, or coming up with an alternate idea. It's then you test these ideas to see what is supported by evidence. Because in science, that's how things are accepted, not on basis of authority. My teacher said so, the textbook said so, but because the evidence supports that. And so there are different models on how the life around us got to its current diversity. There is a creation model, there is an intelligent design model, there is the evolutionary model. These need to be tested. And um, then the follow-up question is, how could one do that? Well, I have separate videos on testing them using anatomical evidence or genetic evidence or fossil evidence or embryological evidence, and there would be others. Um, this is going to look at taxonomy. And taxonomy is going to draw a little bit from the anatomy and a little bit from genetics, but look at it in a, a different you know, framework. Um, and so if I seem to skimp a little bit on the anatomy, you know, do it a little bit uh, or do the genetic evidence a little bit, um, it's because there will be more of that in other videos. Um, the reason we can use taxonomy uh, to test these models is because these models make very different predictions. So for example, the creation model held that life appeared like this. There were no fish and then there were fish. There were no worms and then there were worms. There were no amphibians and then there were amphibians. There were uh, no uh, primates. There were no humans and then there were humans. Now as a result, these organisms had separate origins. They appeared without a common ancestry. So the appearance of the first people was not related to the appearance of uh, earlier primates or amphibians or fish, etc. Now, in biology, we try to group uh, organisms to make meaningful groups. The reason for that is why would we study anatomy of one organism um, if it own, all our conclusions only applied to that one uh, organism? Um, we want real biological groups. We want to say that thing is a primate and that means something, or that's a vertebrate and that means something. But in the creation model, primates don't mean anything. I could put these two together and say, oh, they are both primates. But that's not a real group. They don't share anything. The human would be as unrelated to uh, the other primate as the human would be to any of these. The human would have zero biological connection to this organism and zero uh, uh, biological connections to those organisms. There was primates would not be a real group if the creation model were uh, true. And then that would apply to mammals. Why would one group these organisms together? They share nothing in common. Um, they are as unrelated to each other as they are to rocks or trees. They have zero relationship to each other and they are equally unrelated. So mammals is not a real group in the creation model, nor would amniotes be, nor would vertebrates be, nor would eukaryotes be. All of these would be grouping organisms which have no biological c connection. If these organisms are unrelated and equally unrelated. Putting them together in a biological group is, in a sense, a lie. And if you were to ask, what is the evidence supporting such a uh, grouping, you wouldn't expect to find anatomical evidence, genetic evidence, saying, here's a group of eukaryotes, here's a group of animals, here's a subgroup of animals called the vertebrates, here's a subgroup of vertebrates called the mammals, a subgroup of mammals called the primates, etc., because there would be no grouping. So if 
you try to get evidence that would, you know, say, put, you know, humans more closely related to these organisms, to those organisms, you wouldn't expect to find any simply because these groups would not be real. Um, in uh, biology, we do hold that uh, there are groups. We have what's called the species, all right? We have the genus, the family, the order, the kingdom, um, and these would group organisms together which share a common uh, ancestry. And so, um, there were, in the evolutionary model, ancestors of not only the genus Canis, but then also related uh, genera um, to form a tribe. There would be um, ancestral bears, which would form, um, uh, which would then diversify and form the ancestors of the different subfamilies. Now, in the creation model, uh, originally, it was held that no new species evolved. And so therefore, every single species in this model would then be completely unrelated to each other. Many have then modified that because the evidence against that is so overwhelming and have concluded, well, you know, perhaps some evolution occurs, um, but only within, quote, a kind. Okay, that's a hypothesis. And then the follow-up is, well, what do you mean by kind? And the answer is, I speak as someone who's, you know, read more creationist literature than almost any creationist I've ever met. Um, they avoid that question um, simply because once they try to answer it, they realize that the evidence simply doesn't support them. So when it comes to bears, for example, if you're going to modify this and say, oh, well, maybe some bears are in a kind, all right, is that uh, Ursus arctos, the species and the subspecies? Is that the genus Ursus? Is that the subfamily Ursinae? Is that the subfamily Ursinae and Tremarctinae? Is that all of the bear subfamilies for the bear family? What is a kind in your uh, model? Uh, creationist authors um, trying not to define the kind so that one could make a hypothesis um, because the evidence simply doesn't uh, support uh, that. Uh, and the evidence that would show that would be if there are kinds which share a common ancestry, maybe even within the past couple thousand years, then these would be related. But then this kind would be completely unrelated to that kind. So if you wanted to say, for example, that a subfamily all right, appeared recently and that all of these have evolved from a common ancestor, but that these have nothing, do not have a common ancestry with these, well, then that's, that's fine. Then there shouldn't be any evidence to put the bear family Ursidae in a group because that group is a lie. All right, if this uh, um, group is as unrelated to this group as they are to trees and worms, then there should be no anatomical traits or genetic evidence which would support the union of um, uh, uh, these in a family. Um, and so whether you stick to the original creationist model where every um, species uh, has um, it's a separate uh, origin or a modified uh, creationist uh, model where some uh, species are in a kind, um, uh, then uh, that is one model which could be tested. The evolutionary model is one of a nested hierarchy of living things um, where all life is related, but to varying degrees. There are groups and then there are subgroups and then subgroups within the subgroups, et cetera. And that this then is a hypothesis. If you're saying, I'm not sure about that, I'd like to test that, good. That's your job. You should then ask, all right, what is the evidence for that? So if biologists are going to group all living things, as a group, having shared a common ancestor, all right? You should then ask, what is the evidence for that? And as this video goes out, I'm just gonna quickly summarize. It turns out all living things share stuff, all right? Their membranes are made of phospholipids and cholesterol. Um, not only do they have a nucleic, uh, 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 
genetic code of DNA, which then gets converted into RNA, which then gets converted into um, proteins. Um, but they use the same nucleotides. They use the same amino acids, and they omit the majority of amino acids are not used by any living uh, things. Um, the genetic code is the same, U, 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 uh, codes for phenylalanine, whether you're a bacteria, a yeast, or a human. So at the genetic level, uh, they speak the same um, uh, language. Um, they share so many of the same proteins. There are human red blood cells, which have hemoglobin. There are bacteria, which have globin. There are uh, human cells, which use transcription factors uh, to help embryos um, uh, differentiate, um, but these are similar to the transcription factors which you can find in uh, bacteria. And so there are things that living things share. And I am now testing the models because in the creation model, um, humans and bacteria are 100% unrelated. There is no reason for them to share anything. If the evolution uh, model is true, then we would expect that there would be similarities, and there are. But now let's continue this, because once again, the evolution model just doesn't um, predict similarities, um, but a pattern of similarities. And so, as we compare living things, uh, we find that some share features that bacteria like. So here's a bacteria. And all of these other living things are in the group which we call eukaryotes. Now in the creation model, eukaryotes are a lie. They are not a group. They have zero connection to each other. They are as unrelated to each other as they are to bacteria. But in the evolutionary model, eukaryotes share a common ancestor more recently than they do with bacteria. And so therefore, this subgroup of living things would share features that bacteria lack. And so, um, just I play this video, and you can play it more slowly. You can then go through the list of the features which uh, biology uh, investigations have shown that eukaryotes share a nucleus. Um, and Golgi, cilia and flagella. You might argue, well, don't some bacteria have flagella? Not this kind. Bacterial flagella completely different from the cilia and flagella, which you would find in eukaryotes. The same ways of regulating the um, cell uh, cycle, uh, et cetera. You can then ask, are there um, features which eukaryotes share? Is this sufficient? to support the conclusion that eukaryotes are a real biological group. Because if they are, that supports the evolutionary model, not the creation model. And then one could look at animals, all right? So animals, and once again, we're excluding bacteria and yeast and plants here, but animals would say include sponges. When we consider uh, animals as diverse as humans and sponges, do they share stuff? Well, it turns out that they do. All right, collagen is the major extracellular protein. Receptor tyrosine kinases are very important um, signaling, uh, uh, signaling molecules. Uh, the uh, multicellularity that they have and the cell junctions which they use to uh, achieve this. Um, and so sponges and humans share things that humans do not share with plants or with fungi or with amoeba, or with bacteria. So in the biological sense, there's now evidence that animals are a group. Within the animals, there is another group called the metazoan animals, which excludes the sponges. But it would include things like um, uh, jellyfish, corals, uh, hydra, etc. Um, these uh, organisms, the metazoans, they share a number of genes, such as the genes which regulate um, uh, DNA expression. Um, these organisms share uh, nervous systems. Uh, jellyfish have nervous systems. Their neurons conduct electricity, just as the neurons in the human brain conduct electricity. Their muscles conduct electricity before then the sarcomeres uh, contract, same as in human muscles. Once again, you can go through the video and ask, is there evidence that metazoans form a group? 
if metazoans mean something, if you can say, look, there's a metazoan animal, and you can say, oh, I'll bet it has a nervous system which expresses these genes. I'll bet it has a muscular system which expresses these genes. I'll bet it regulates transcription in this way, et cetera. If you can do that, then there is biological support for uh, metazoan animals being a uh, group. Um, in the creation model, humans and jellyfish are not a group. They are 100% unrelated. They are equally unrelated to each other as they are to plants and fungi, etc. And so evidence for uh, metazoans being a group is evidence for the evolution model and against the uh, creation model. And then we can go on and on. Um, and so we can look at the bilaterians, uh, the worms, uh, and other uh, invertebrates. Um, we can look at chordates. So in biological taxonomy that I'm sure you know we've all learned in grade school, you know we, we have uh, organisms which are in the kingdom animalia. So animals, that's a group called a kingdom. Then there are subkingdoms, etc. Um, then there's a phylum, and um, we humans we are in the phylum chordata. Well, in the creation model. You know, the phylum chordata, it doesn't mean anything. It, it's, re, it's false. It's a lie, right? Putting, you know, humans in a, a group with, um, I'm sorry. So putting humans in a group with this invertebrate called a lancelet, um, there's no reason for it, all right? In the creation model, we are 100% unrelated. But this lancelet then has a notochord like the fish do, uh, do, uh, do. It has a throat with slits forming gills like fish have. It has a post-anal tail like the vertebrates have, but not the other invertebrates other than uh, chordates. Uh, the nerve cord is hollow and tends to be on the back. The heart tends to be on the front. There's the homologue of a liver, a thyroid gland, etc. We could go on. There is no reason for this. This little wormy invertebrate doesn't have to have features with the fish because the other wormy invertebrates don't. The world is full of worms that don't have a postanal tail, a throat with uh, gills, uh, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, a notochord, a liver, a thyroid, etc. All right, and so there is no reason for this little wormy invertebrate, if it's 100% unrelated to, um, to vertebrates, to have these features. Now you might say fish have a throat with uh, slits, but we don't, but we do as embryos, as shown here in this pig, this um, chicken, and this human, all right? So we, there are features which chordates share. Now, some of these, maybe they don't, uh, they're not shared in adults and maybe just in embryos, but nevertheless, there are these traits which group us. That is consistent with the predictions of the evolutionary model, but that is the opposite of what is predicted by the uh, creation model. Intelligent design is easier to discuss uh, with anatomy and genetics, but the major argument of intelligent design is that complexity cannot develop in stages. Well, here is a lancelet, a little invertebrate that has some features of the fish, including features um, uh, like gills, which uh, is important in how the fish uh, breathe, uh, uh, features like the homologue of a liver, a thyroid, uh, et cetera. And so this little lancelet has some, but not all of the features of the fish. Um, uh, that is the exact opposite of what intelligent uh, design uh, predicts. And so um, I have a playlist. I think you know, there's 70 videos or so uh, in it. But it goes through these groups. And then you should be the judge. All right, once again, don't take my word for it. Um, that's the point. That's why we're doing this. So you don't take my word for it, or a textbook's word for it, or a website's word for it. But you say, all right, there are these two models. I am going to look at the, uh, these models and their predictions. All right, the evolutionary model predicts that all of these things will be related, that there will be a nested hierarchy of groups within groups, depending on the branching of the family tree. And then if that is true, there should be anatomical and genetic features which support this, which help to show that these groups in uh, uh, actuality are real. 
Whereas in the creation model, these groups are a lie. Mammals are a lie. You shouldn't put things together which are unrelated. Um, vertebrates are a lie. Eukaryotes are a lie. These things are not only unrelated, they are equally unrelated. And expecting there to be features which unite them in a group is inconsistent with the predictions of this model. And so, as you go through these videos, you can ask, are there, is there evidence that vertebrates form a real biological group? Or is there evidence that the osteopteans, the bony fish, form uh, a real biological groups? Are there features which bony fish and humans share that say sharks or lampreys don't have? Um, is there evidence that sarcopterygian fish form a group? Uh, so you say, oh, some of them have lungs. Some of them have homologs of the um, of the bones uh, which amphibians have in their arms and uh, legs. And, and so, yes, so lungs would be something that not only do the land vertebrates have, but also these sarcopterygian fish. Um, one doesn't expect that. Most fish don't have lungs. If um, uh, sarcopterygian fish were as unrelated to amphibians as they are to worms, then would, one would not expect them to have features uh, which the land uh, vertebrates have. Uh, and so do tetrapods form a group? Do humans have the same bones, the same muscles as, say, amphibians? Do, do amniotes form a group? Do mammals form a group? Do live-bearing therian mammals form a group? Do placental mammals form uh, a group? Do primates form uh, a group, which would, in say, include lemurs? Do um, anthropoid primates, which includes uh, South American and Old World monkeys, but excludes lemurs, do they form a group? Do catarine primates of Old World monkeys and apes form a group? Do apes form a group? Do, does the family hominidae form a group which excludes the gibbons? Um, does the subfamily hominidae form uh, a group? You should ask, if it's a biological group, show me the evidence. What are the features which this group shares? And you can go through these videos to see, is there you know, anatomical support for uh, these groups? Um, the creation model holds that these are not real groups. They are not um, uh, biologically uh, connected. And so there is not the expectation that there will be shared uh, uh, features. Okay. Now, um, that was kind of focusing on um, anatomy. Uh, and I do discuss anatomy in a separate video, uh, and I discuss genetics in a, sec a separate video. But let me just highlight a little bit based on um, some of the genetics here. In our current classification scheme, um, chimpanzees are the closest relative of humans, and humans are the closest relative of chimps. Right, chimps are more closely related to humans than they are to other apes. And there is genetic evidence for this, that at a genetic level, our DNA, our proteins, um, there are more similarities between humans and chimps than with any other individual. So for example, take the protein beta hemoglobin. It is identical in humans and chimps. Gorillas have one amino acid difference between the human and chimp uh, sequences. So while the, uh, when human red blood cell precursors make beta hemoglobin and choose a specific amino acid order, it is exactly what uh, the two species of chimpanzee will do. Gorillas will uh, make an almost identical protein, but it will have one amino acid um, a difference. Uh, orangutans will have two and so forth that there uh, then are uh, just more and more uh, differences supporting that living things are related but to varying degrees. Now one could then, uh, then uh, do a study which then kind of creates a family tree just based on sequence similarities. Let's look at the sequences of DNA. Let's look at amino acid sequences. Let's pick one gene. Let's pick lots of genes. Let's pick nuclear genes. Let's pick mitochondrial genes. Let's use um, genes which code for proteins. Let's use genes which code for RNA, which never becomes uh, proteins, etc. When we do this, we see that humans, this is using mitochondrial 
um, uh, uh, genome comparisons. And the length of the bars uh, represent uh, nucleotide uh, substitutions. Um, uh, the degree of difference, so the longer the bars, the greater uh, the, the distances. Um, humans uh, and chimps are more closely related to each other genetically using mitochondrial DNA than to any other group. But here's genetic evidence for apes. Not only is there anatomical evidence that suggests that apes are a group, but here is genetic evidence using something completely different. All right, so mitochondrial sequences are not directly coding for the loss of the tail or the muscle groups which are defining apes as a group. So these are two completely different studies which are coming to the exact same conclusion which supports the evolutionary model and refutes the creation model. Here it shows that the apes and the old world monkeys form a group just like the anatomy suggests. Here it shows that the apes, the old world monkeys, and the new world monkeys form a group, just like the anatomy suggested. You add in the uh, lemurs, then the order primates forms a group more closely related to each other than to any other uh, group. And we live in an era where genetic sequences uh, you know, are pu published by the thousands and thousands. So if you have these models, you can test them. All right, and, and you should, that's what we do in science. We test our ideas. So if you wanted to look for um, uh, the uh, carnivores and say, all right, well, you know, there's dogs, there's bears, there's cats. How are they related? Is there evidence for a cat family, a dog family, a bear family, uh, suborders, uh, which include the dog suborder, um, uh, the cat uh, suborder, the order carnivora, uh, Etc. Um, and so uh, you could then investigate uh, these um, uh, studies. So I, I have just samples. I mean, there are just tens and tens of thousands of these. I'm only given a couple in animation form, and I obviously I give the uh, citations so that you can uh, read uh, the papers uh, which uh, supported uh, this. But if you were to take these songbirds and ask, um, are they completely unrelated to each other? No, all right, so we see that um, songbirds are all related to each other, but to varying degrees. We have orders and suborders and families, you know, et cetera. Um, in the creation model, beyond a kind, whatever that is, and creations haven't defined that for songbirds or for any other group that has been accepted by the majority of creationists, um, uh, this certainly, um, uh, this is the exact opposite of what uh, creationists uh, uh, predict. And as I discuss elsewhere in this playlist, um, I just go through, you know, group after group. And, and so um, the genetic studies of mammals have all supported the evolutionary uh, concept of a nested hierarchy uh, within mammals, not the um, uh, completely unrelated uh, uh, grouping uh, that the creation model would, uh, would predict. If once again, one had a modified creationist model saying some mammals are related um, in a kind but not others, well, well fine. Where in the evidence are there these kinds? Do a genetic sequence. Humans and um, uh, chimps are more closely related to each other than many uh, uh, groups, or, you know, kinds that creationists have proposed. So some um, some uh, creations have said, you know, uh, humans and chimps aren't related to uh, each other, but certainly all rodents are, or maybe all of the dogs are, or all of the bats are. Well, once again, if the lengths of these lines is representing the degree of genetic difference. Look at the lengths of the line that separate bats compared to say humans and chimps. Humans and chimps are far more genetically related to each other than bats are to each other. And so some creations have said, oh, I think this might be a kind, you know, descended from a common ancestor in the past couple thousand years, but these could never descend from a common ancestor, not even in five to seven million years because of how different they are. 
that's a hypothesis, but it just is refuted by uh, the data. The data shows it to just be false. And so there can be studies made, you know, one gene or two gene, or, you know, by now we've created, you know, so many sequences have been collected that one can compare thousands of sequences. So this is an enormously powerful study using thousands of sequences um, to support uh, the grouping of uh, these uh, organisms in a way which overwhelmingly uh, supports the um, evolution model and refutes uh, the creation model. Um, and so we could see that here. So once again, with turtles, some creations have said, well, maybe this form a group of turtles is a group and that form uh, a group of turtles is a group, but I don't think we want to say that all turtles are a group. Well, there's just no evidence that, you know, here's genetic uh, sequences showing that, you know, these turtles are very closely related, but they are as unrelated to other turtles as they are to worms and plants and fungi, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, one uh, sees this pattern everywhere, all right? So whether one considers mammals or birds or turtles or frogs or, um, uh, or all vertebrates or fish, fish are coming up, I swear, somewhere, um, uh, or uh, insects, uh, et cetera. So, okay. Oh, Um, one just sees this nested hierarchy of groups within groups. All are related, but to varying degrees, representing the branching of a great family tree over time. So in biology, we talk about insects as a group or the beetle order Coleoptera as uh, a group. And there is biological evidence to support that, anatomical traits and genetics. The creation model holds that these are 100% unrelated if they don't form a kind and creations uh, simply can't agree on uh, what a kind is, not even close. Um, and so this evidence strongly supports the evolution model, strongly refutes uh, the creation model. The same then is true of fungi or of uh, protists uh, or of uh, bacteria. And so in biology, we classify uh, things into groups to make biology manageable. And in a way, as we do this, we are testing these various models because if a group is real, then there should be anatomical and genetic traits which members of the group share. That's why they're classified in the group. In the evolutionary model, these groups are real. They're real because they share a biological ancestor and they are now sharing the gene sequences or the um, anatomical traits which their biological ancestor uh, possessed. But in the creation model, these groupings are simply a lie. See this branching pattern? This is showing relationships between organisms which in the creation model are 100% unrelated to each other. Um, so uh, when you have these uh, models, um, they then get tested. And um, then uh, in, uh, and the evidence simply does not uh, support uh, the creation model. It overwhelmingly supports uh, the evolutionary model. My final point is I, I have a bias. I really, really want the evolutionary model to be true. Now I still have to you know, study it in question and, and be prepared to reject it. Um, but I want it to be true. Why? Because if it doesn't, if, it, if evolution wasn't true, biology would be a horrible field of study and it would certainly be a horrible field uh, to teach. Why? Because I teach anatomy, I teach genetics. Who would study anatomy if every time you studied an organism that it was 100% different from the next organism that you studied? All right, so you'd have to memorize all of these muscles and then the next organism that you study memorize a whole bunch of different muscles or brain regions or blood vessels or genes. There would be no connection expected between organisms which are 100% different. But if you were to say study comparative vertebrate anatomy or the anatomy of mammals like this goat, you could say, oh, it's a mammal? Oh, 
I'm going to make predictions which turn out to be true because I know it's a mammal. I'm going to say, oh, well, I'm sure it has, you know, a deltoid or maybe a couple of separate, you know, deltoids which together form uh, a single deltoid. It has a triceps, a brachialis. Now, that's amazing because I have those muscles, but I do things with my hands like play guitar and, and paddle a kayak. Um, but those are the same muscles that you would find in a cat or a goat, even though these um, organisms are uh, doing things completely different from their uh, arms. So this, in the creation model, this monkey is 100% um, unrelated to me. But anatomically, it is practically the same. All right, the, the muscle, the nerves, etc. And from biology, that's now important because when one studies one mammal, you can now make predictions about other mammals which turn out to be true on the muscles that they have, the brain regions that they have, the genes that they have, on which chromosomes the genes are, how many genes are in a row. You can make incredibly precise predictions which turn out to be true. The evolutionary model is so incredibly valuable, which is why in the aftermath of the you know, acceptance of evolution, the field of biology has accumulated knowledge, I would argue, faster than any other field of study in human history. Evolution has allowed us to make predictions which turn out to be true. We understand anatomy and genetics and embryology so much better because of applying the um, predictions of anatomy. If the creationist model were true, and this monkey was 100% unrelated to me, or this goat was 100% unrelated to me, or this cat, what predictions would I make about something which is 100% unrelated to the things that I've already studied? None necessarily. And, and so I wouldn't necessarily learn every, anything. In the creation model, biology would just be this endless set of facts to memorize with nothing joining them. It just wouldn't make sense. It would be a horrible field to study and a horrible field to teach. But biology is a wonderful field to study and a wonderful field to teach because there are patterns. And when one learns you know, the pattern, one can now make predictions about things which are true. And you can do this. So once again, don't take my word for anything in science. That's not what we do. Make predictions. So think of, say, the evolution model, creation model, or any other model that you choose. And then say, all right, what predictions would this say about groups like mammals, vertebrates, etc.? And then go out and study those groups and, and ask yourself, what does the evidence support? And those who classify life's Organism, organisms and diversity into groups overwhelmingly support the evolutionary model and overwhelmingly refute the creation model.